It gives me great delight to introduce to you moderator Gemma Greaves. Uh, Gemma is the global MD of the Marketing Society. When we talk about connections, she's probably one of the most connected people in the industry. She's recently launched Marketing Society in Asia and is the founder of Cabal. Um, so please join me in welcoming Gemma to the stage. I think you should invite all the panellists up. So if you'd all like to, yeah. to come up. There's one microphone here. We've got enough seats. Yeah, yeah it's next to me. I forget that when I whisper, I'm on microphone, so everyone just heard me say that. Someone want to take that? Whoever's going to go first? You can go first, Johnny. There we go. Excellent. Well, welcome to today's panel discussion, um, all about data, which is, which is very exciting. Um, we're hoping to get a bit of a debate going. Um, it's all around. Um, the notion of data-driven businesses, are they far from reality? So just first like to um, introduce the panel. You've obviously already met Ben, um, so I don't know if you need much of an introduction really, um, but, but welcome to Ben. Um, Daniel Hume, the founder and CEO of Satalia, and I'm sure you'll talk a bit more about who Satalia is in a, in a second. Um, Pam Conway, the head of energy efficiency at British Gas. It's hard to see you all, because we're all in such a straight line. Uh, Johnny Quinn, who's musician and founder of Polar Patrol Publishing, and Jeremy Lee, who is a freelance writer and former deputy editor of Campaign. So um, what I thought I'd do is I'd start with actually the, the big question today and see what the panel thinks. And feel free to disagree. That would, that would be good if we can get some um, different opinions up here. Um, so do you think data-driven driven businesses are far from reality? I'm going to start with you because you've got a microphone, Johnny. Uh, no, I think uh, data-driven uh, information is really important and it's being used in the music industry right now. I've got some examples about it. I can... I can tell you. Um, yeah. So um, I, I work in music publishing, and I work with a company called Cobalt, who um, basically tag songs to find out the revenue that's due to them. And they can collect 30% more revenue um, than any other publisher by using this information. It's data-driven. And it's mainly out on the internet. So it's actually happening right now, and it's quite a huge um, part of what we do. Fantastic. Daniel, what do you think? Do you think? Data-driven businesses are reality. Maybe explain who, who, who you are, Satalia is. Uh, yes, so Satalia is a spin-out of UCL, uh, which solves uh, optimization problems for industry. Essentially, it's a decision-making uh, engine. I think to, to create something that's truly automated, that gets data, extracts insights from data, and then makes decisions based on those insights, we, we are quite far away from there. We are making decisions, humans are making decisions from from insights, uh, I would argue that some of those decisions are not very good. Uh, maybe I can give you an example. Uh, so for example, if I uh, said to you that your life depended on answering this question well, which is uh, a bat and a ball combined cost is one pound and 10 pence, and the bat is one pound more than the ball, how much is the ball? And yeah, what's the answer to that? 10, no, it's not. No. Uh, it's not 10 pence, so automatically you, know, you, you decide that it's, it's 10 pence, it's, it's, the, the ball is 5 pence, the, the bat is 1 pound more than the ball, which makes the, the bat 1 pound and 5 pence. Uh, so that's an example where humans' biases uh, mean that we make bad decisions. Uh, but also if I asked you, for example, to, uh, to work out the, the shortest route uh, around some number of points in London, uh, let's say 20 points, and I asked you to figure out what the shortest route is, and again, your business, your life depended on working out that shortest route, uh, you might be confident that you can work that out. Actually, it would probably take about 20 billion years for you to answer that question. Uh, so uh, the, the decision making is actually very, very hard. Fair enough. Ben, ben do you want to comment on that? I think um, <clears throat> that data-driven businesses are a reality in pockets. I don't think that there are many businesses that are truly data-driven uh, end-to-end. I think there are parts of businesses are. Um, you know, mostly what comes out of, you know, the, the sort of supply chain and finance side of the business. Um, I think when you start to look at, you know, operations, customer service and marketing um, and how those all join up together, that's far less. Um, there are s businesses that have been built from the ground up to be data driven. Mm -hmm. 
And those are the ones we all know about. Those are the ones that have leveraged technology and, and, and an architecture that allows them to do that. Um, but in, in most large enterprises that have been around for a while, there's still a long, long way to go um, for the, the culture, the majority of people and ways of operating in those businesses to be data-driven. Um, so yes, it's popular to talk about it, and, and I won't use the, the BD word, but um, you BD. know, the big data. <laughs> uh, I just wanted you to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone just lost a bet somewhere. Um, I, I think there's still a long way to go uh, when, you, when you look at what data-driven really means. Thank you. Pam, would you, would you agree with that? Yes, Ben and I were talking about this earlier, so definitely agree that um, if you are a young technology-driven company, then it's more likely that you're going to be end-to-end data-driven. But if you're a larger organization or been established for a while, it's much more difficult, partly because of culture, but partly because um, we're overwhelmed by the amount of data that's out there. I don't think people realize how much is available to us. And the danger is that every piece of data is given a value, which it doesn't. There is a lot of useless data out there. And you as a business have to decide what is important to you. And you can only do that by understanding what is important to your customers. And so any data-driven business has to be a customer-focused business. Thank you. And Jeremy, do you want to just comment on that? Yeah, I'd just like... I'd just like to say, um, I'd, I'd be curious to know what the panel think, whether it's possible for these large organisations to catch up and you know, become data-driven, or is the legacy too long? I mean, you talked about the fact that the systems have been in place for so long. How do they actually turn that around and become data-driven? You're meant to be answering the questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't That's know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 well, but anyone... It's a question. <laughs> yes. I think it can happen. It depends on the mandate from the senior leadership within the business, um, the amount of money willing to be invested, um, and, and how you approach it. Uh, an example would be, in, you know, this fits within uh, uh, what Daniel does. Um, do you actually go, I, I can't get enough of, of people trained. I can't get those skills. I'm actually going to take people out. I'm going to actually start to architect my business in a way that um, takes people out of the equation. I'm going to look at all of the decisions that happen on a daily basis. I'm going to find all the repeatable decisions, the ones that are made every day, the same decisions by a whole v wide variety of people. I'm going to take their biases, they're having a good day, a bad day, their opinions, their feelings out, and I'm going to make those decisions something that are automated. I'm going to figure out how to do that with an algorithm. I'm going to figure out how to do that with a piece of technology. I'm actually just going to take people out of the equation. These decisions over here, I still need people to do. Um, that could be done at scale. That could be done very fast. Um, it takes a commitment and an understanding and an investment from, from the senior leadership in a business for it to happen. Uh, and, you know, in, in difficult business climates, uh, at the moment, those bold decisions don't happen very often. Thank you, Ben. I was actually going to say that it seems you can have all the processes, technology and data in place, but, and, uh, but if you don't have the, the skills and understanding and decision-making within your business, then, then really it's, it's kind of useless, isn't it? And so, Pam, I just wanted to pick up from a big business like British Gas. How do you think we can adapt and change to um, use data more effectively? So I think there's a slight danger in what Ben has described, where you're taking people out of the decision-making process altogether, simply because data is just a report of the facts. It doesn't always give you context or the why of what's going on. And I just want to give you an example, and I'll come back to your question in a moment, Gemma, but I want to give you an example of where we're now able, through smart data, to analyze what customers' energy use is being um, uh, used on, from everything from washing machines and so forth. But it's all based on algorithms, and that will produce a report. And in the past, what we've decided to look at is being able to offer people contextual energy efficiency advice on the back of that breakdown of data. But the problem is, because it's based on algorithms, which is based on assumptions and pattern identification, what's happening is it's not necessarily the reality. So a piece of advice went to a customer saying, we see you're using your um, dishwasher an awful lot. Have you thought about doing X, Y, and Z? And the customer wrote back and said, 
actually, I don't have a dishwasher. That's very interesting. Um, can you cut, reduce my bill? Because you've obviously got it wrong because I don't have a dishwasher. And this is all about pattern identification. So there's a lot more to be done about starting with the customer first. And I think any large organization that wants to use data meaningfully has to embed a customer-focused culture first, speak to the customer, generate the insight, create the hypothesis, and then use the data to help you understand and validate and test and trial and develop. Okay, and how do you think a big business like British Gas can really train their staff to be able to use data more effectively? I mean, in lots of businesses, data seems to be kind of to put in the corner, but actually it's, it's something that's so important and we, you know, should we have, should it be integrated into departments? How do you think um, we can move forward? So at British Gas, mm. the data is definitely not in the corner. Um, smart meters, we're getting kind of data on a, you know, minute by minute basis from people and that will only grow. Mm. Um, it's embedded into every part of the business in terms of the operation. So data is given out to field agents before they turn up to do an, a servicing visit so that they know about the customer. They understand what product holding they have, they understand if they've called us previously, what their service history is. So they're going into that customer's house prepared to have a much more a valuable conversation with the customer about their needs at that moment in time in terms of the service that they're about to do. So when it comes to training the business, I think our issue is about multiple sources of data and training people to understand what is useful. And again, I go back to the point about customer focus. If you can create a culture of customer focus and understand where data plays a role in understanding customers and govern the process of distribution of data and the use of data, um, then you're probably, on the, you know, you're probably on the path to success. Thank you. I was about to ask you, oh, uh, if you want to comment yeah, on. Yeah, great. So the, I think you, you use the word understanding, and this is a really important distinction between finding some patterns in some data. So the example I use, and forgive me if you've been in my workshop today, but when the temperature increases, you, you sell more ice creams. And, uh, and, and I can draw a very nice uh, regression line through, through that, that graph. And, and it might make a prediction that as the temperature gets warmer, tomorrow it might be hotter, so I'm going to sell more ice creams. Uh, that's what the, 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 the data or this pattern tells me. Um, but we all know that after a certain temperature, like nobody can even move, right? So you don't even leave the house. Uh, so you, you stay at home. And so if you just relied on, on this pattern, then, um, then you would be making very bad decisions. So it's really important that people understand why you sell more ice creams when it's warm outside. And if I asked you to, to create that narrative, it's actually a really complicated narrative, right? When it's hot outside, people are hot. When people are hot, they don't like being hot, and they can then buy something that they eat or consume that cools them down, and, that, and they consume it and it cools them down, and they feel nicer. So there's a very complex nar narrative to help you understand why you sell more ice creams when it's hotter. And, and it's very, very, very difficult to get computers to be able to understand or create that narrative. But if you do, if you can create that narrative, then you can automate the process. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Johnny, from a, a music industry point of view, how has how's data impacted the way the music industry has, uh, has, has changed so much? Well, well, the industry, as everybody knows, is on its knees. Um, I didn't want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, there's been, I think the, it's shrunk by about 65%. Um, and that, you know, it's a huge amount since, you know, people in 1973 spent twice as much on recorded music as they do today. So the problem is uh, there's young artists coming through, you know, the, the investment in, in the new blood. And that's kind of um, quite scary that we can't invest in that. And, and what this data is able to do is show us how to be more efficient. And so breaking a new act can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds and it costs a lot of money because you've got a tour and that's very expensive. So if we can look at data, like we can look at um, our age group um, of our fans, gender and exactly which cities, um, well then we can find out to do a touring route that will save us a whole bunch of money. So you can find out that maybe in Boston I've got a lot of fans, so let's play there. Rather than traveling all the way to Philadelphia to find out that you're going to lose three, four grand, you can skip that and go to somewhere else where you know that you've got 
this following. Um, you can, you can uh, buy your merchandise according to, if you know your fans are between 15 and 19 and they're mostly female, you, you, you cater your merchandise for that. So you make more money there, you don't have loads of merch sitting there. Um, and you know, so all this information is, um, is helping uh, the industry at the moment in terms of the, you know, new people coming through. Um, I, like there's, another, there's another thing that um, really helped Ed Sheeran actually was Twitter mm -hmm. and he went on tour with us about three years ago in America and he was on Twitter, early adopter, he had about a million followers quite early on and he couldn't get played on radio and what he did was he got all his followers to say why don't you hit up Radio 1 and tell them to play Ed Sheeran and Radio 1 what they do is they drill down to look at what age group your fans are because the remit is you've got to play to you got to cater to 13 to 24 age group, and they found out that Ed Sheeran's fans were between exactly the people they should be playing to, and so they started playing Ed Sheeran, and as we know, he's never off the radio. So I think that's using this data to to really help the new artists coming through. So it's it's really key. Yeah, thank you. And what about from a journalism point of view? How's how's data transforming the way people respond to articles? And well, pretty fundamentally, and I think it's important to keep journalism and entertainment separately. I mean, a bit like. The music industry publishing is on its knees as well. Uh, what data has allowed <coughs> journalists to do and entertainment companies is actually you now identify what's popular uh, by using data analytics and then produce more of that. Now the alternative argument is that you're not actually, in terms of journalistically, you're not actually giving them real news, you're just giving them more of what they want. And sometimes what they want is not what they should be hearing. So it's a, it's a, it's a complicated one, but I think it's sort of provided publishing with a revenue stream and some hope, but I'm not convinced that it's, in terms of journalism, it's necessarily a particularly good thing. Okay, interesting. Ben, would you want to comment on that? Um, I think every, every uh, industry, every sector um, is, is approaching what they can do with data slightly differently, and it tends to be from their current paradigm. So, you know, uh, if they're retailers, they're looking to get more footfall and make sure that the products that are in those stores or, or online are the right products and they can get the right kind of conversions. Uh, you know, if they're um, financial services businesses, they're looking at, you know, how they can move beyond uh, a product level view of their customer um, into a sense of, you know, a lifetime and, and how you can, uh, you know, create a sense of um, product value um, over a period of time. So I think everybody's approaching it slightly differently. I think um, it's still at the moment being fit into this is what we do, these are the processes we have, this is the way we operate our business, so where's the opportunity? There's not many businesses who are sitting there going, you know, if we were creating our business today, what would we do? Mm -hmm. how, how would we interact with our customers today? And if we interacted with our customers in that way, what would we need? Mm -hmm. And if we know what we need, then we can put that together and then data has a purpose. And, and this is where I, I agree completely with what Pam was saying. Um, that, that you have to start with what it is you want to happen. What do you want customers to do? Is it about the, how they interact with you? Is it about the way that they buy from you? Is it about the um, efficiency that that, 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 that that buying experience has? Or is it the variety of that buying experience? Or is it the regularity of that buying experience? And then work back from that and go, okay, how do I architect things to provide that? You know, is it about the experience? Is it about the, the level of personalization that sits underneath it? Is it about the predictive element of it? What is it? You know, what will make our business that better, much better? And then get to the data. Um, at the moment, it's a case of we've got data in some systems. Let's use it. Uh, and, and, and then you struggle. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a really good time to open out to the audience. So is there any questions in this question from the audience that we've had this morning? Yeah, oh, wonderful. If you, um, there's a mic. Yeah, lovely. You can just say your name and, and where you're from. Thank you. And who you're directing the question to. Uh, David Reed from Data IQ. And the question is actually for Daniel Hume. Uh, ben touched on the, the issue of culture within organizations um, and the potential for that to be a barrier to becoming data driven. So I'm very interested in how you, when you're working with your clients, who firstly don't understand what it is that you do, and secondly, don't have the joy of working with data and maths, et cetera, that you do, 
How do you translate what you're finding out into a language that they can understand? Uh, so I, I tried to, I've spent seven years trying to understand how to do that myself, and I, I still struggle. Um, you're right, there's a problem, which is people don't really understand um, the, the, the problems that they, that they have. And um, I guess what I try to encourage organizations to do is, as Ben absolutely said, is, is figure out what is their biggest pain and then uh, work out how we might be able to approach. What, what does success mean in, in addressing that, that pain? And, uh, and I'm actually a big fan of open data, open innovation, and I think that there are opportunities for organizations to make their data available, because they don't have to often have the skills inside the organization to try and address some of these problems, like, like you alluded to. And I think that there are opportunities for organizations to make their questions available, not just their data, because actually there's loads of data available. What, what, people need is the question, what is the problem that needs solving? And, uh, and, then, and then leaving it to the community to try and come up with solutions. And, and so I try to encourage uh, organizations to open up their data and to anonymize it. And it's a real problem, I'm sure that many of you know, that getting data from, from an organization is, is ridiculously hard, unless you tell them that you're gonna save them a million pounds, in which case it becomes very, very easy. Um, but uh, I, I guess we start with, the, as Ben said, the customer, the, the problem, and, uh, and ultimately they need to trust that you can deliver on that, and then and, and you gain trust by either they know you or you've delivered in the past for other organizations. So it's an obvious uh, uh, answer. Sorry, it wasn't that insightful. <laughs> I'm just gonna build on that, actually. Um, one of the things you were talking about around you know, business challenges, you, you did something quite just, just it's, it's, quite, it's quite boring, but actually I might be able to make a, an, an analogy. But um, we, we worked <laughs> with a, a telco uh, company um, over the past few years where if you, if you walk through London, um, a particularly busy period, then you probably won't get reception or data on, on your phone. Uh, that's because all of the telephony is, is provided in what is called a cell. There's like a mobile phone mask that's providing the telephony and data and texts and, and stuff. And at particularly busy times, it becomes congested. And so what's happening now is that telcos are rolling out these kind of essentially boosters that they're trying to figure out where to place. And uh, the, the challenge is figuring out, first of all, where people are. You, you, think, you might think that telcos know where you are. Uh, precisely, and, and actually they don't. They, they know where you are within, a, within quite a large region because they, they know that you're in this cell, but they don't know precisely where you are. And so our challenge was to try and bring together data sets to try and predict where people are and then, then figure out where do we place these boosters to cover that, that demand. And, and that sounds a bit boring, but I had a conversation yesterday with a company, which, and this is the analogy, which is uh, if they wanted to tweet something, who should they mention in that tweet that meant that they were going to get retweeted? So you imagine this, the, the, the Twitter sphere. Who should they, where should they place these tweets? Who should they mention to try and cover that space? Does that make sense? It's kind of the, the same problem. And when you start thinking about optimization, you start to realize that all of these problems that we're dealing with actually are the same sort of problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, Sounds very clever. But it, it, it's <laughs> nothing to do with me. That's <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> actually, my um, uh, comment actually was just to answer about the, the guy who's sitting next to me's question really about, again, about an insight about how to uh, get data out of, of clients. Sorry, my name's Martin Brooks from Habas Work Club. Um, and uh, two examples, one from our, our most glamorous client, which is McLaren Formula One, and our least glam glamorous client, which is... Um, uh, rent -a kill who, who are the world leaders in killing rats and, uh, and cleaning... He'll be pleased you've said that. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so getting data out of rent -a kill um, was quite hard to start with until we made heroes of them through the data. So what we found was that they could tell when there was going to be a flu epidemic in the UK uh, two weeks before, but because of their information that they were getting from Poland. And so that was enabled... The, the people going around washrooms in the UK to say stock up on, you know, on all the things that make a washroom better in, a, in, a, in an office. And so by doing that, we were able to establish an expertise position. We are the world leaders. We are the world experts because we've got the data about what's happening absolutely everywhere. Um, and so then that suddenly put the spotlight on those people who were gathering the data and made them feel like heroes, which allowed them, you know, made them give us more. Second example was with McLaren. Um, where we said, look, you've got all this amazing data from the car on the track that's going to the pit lane that's being broadcast you know, directly or streamed directly to, to Woking, the mission control, and said, look, give us that data. And, and uh, they said, we can't, it's secret, it's ours. We said, give us the data because we, with that data, we can then create an amazing immersive experience 
for Formula One fans to actually know exactly what's going on in the car at any moment, live on the track, wherever it is around the world. And again, we make the data and stat people become heroes within the organization. So, you know, as ever, it's all about understanding, you know, human motivation. And in that case, it was making heroes of the people who are actually collecting the data. Sorry, long, it wasn't even a, a question. It was just I think a, stopping a flu uh, epidemic. <laughs> I think stopping a flu epidemic in an office is, a, is an amazing thing. I wish it happened in my office. Any, any other um, questions from the audience? Yeah, I think there's one at the back. You, you could shout, uh, you could wait for the microphone. I'll just, I'll just shout out. Awesome. Say who you are as well. Yeah. start with the first question. Um, I, think, I think in general in every sector there are companies that are, are, that are, that are leading and, and lagging. Um, I think some of those businesses are uh, you know, slightly more focused. I, I take financial services, take retail banking, uh, you know, businesses like uh, the Metro Bank um, you know, providing an experience from start to finish of 32 minutes to get a checking account. Um, I don't know any other banks that can replicate that. I don't know any other banks that can give you your new debit card with your PIN and your online banking signed up in 32 minutes. Why can they do that? Because they have a, a, a data and technology uh, layer that sits underneath that. Um, uh, you know, if you go into any of the other established banks, uh, it's unbelievably horrible in comparison. My apologies to anybody who works in that. Uh, you know, but so you've got within that space a, 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 a bank that is able to set itself apart on that experience. Um, the Metro Banks, by the way, disclaimer, they're not a client. Um, the Metro Banks um, uh, um, staff are not um, focused on sales. They have absolutely no personal commission or benefit from any of the products they sell. They're able to do that because the experience stands alone and counts for itself. Um, I think in retailing, I, you know, I gave the example of Walmart, who've invested um, a lot of money, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, in creating the infrastructure and everything that sits underneath that to sort of uh, leverage, uh, you know, what they're doing. So, uh, you know, um, Barclays uh, in financial services with a Ping It app, you know, uh, creating what is now the largest acquisition channel for checking accounts. Um, no piece of advertising, no piece of traditional marketing has done a better job of getting people to sign up to Barclays checking accounts. I think I'm using American terminology. Um, to 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 to, um, to to do that than than an app uh, that, that was basically a service driven product. So I think in in every sector there are people who are doing very well and there are people who are lagging very much behind. Sure. You. Oh, you, you're sure. <laughs> Does anyone else want to build on that, Pam? Do you want to? Again, I agree with Ben. There are. Um, there are people who are leading the way. I don't think, as we discussed earlier, that anybody's nailed it, especially in the larger organizations. Um, again, taking that example of the banking sector, financial services, there are little um, customer moments at where you'll get something like ping it, or you'll get something as simple as an alert about when you're about to go and overdrawn, which just, because at that moment in time, it's really helpful. You give it much more value than anything else, which is then fundamentally undermined by the fact that when you're trying to get an overdraft, <laughs> that they turn around and say, the computer says no. Um, so I think as a, in the larger organizations, bigger corporate organizations, what we need to do is one, find those brilliant moments of truth, those moments in time where we can be incredibly helpful, where it has a huge emotional value to the customer, and ensure that we don't undermine it with those bigger requests and deliver that end-to-end -end service. And again, that's where we struggle as bigger corporations because we'll have um, pockets and departments that are doing those little wonderful things and yet other areas that are, that are still developing. And that's why I think, again, 
the smaller, more technology-driven organizations which have come from a customer focus, customer experience, and they're picking up on those individual moments. So the um, company Glow, that are doing the, the help around uh, pregnancy, that they're picking on particular moments, and that's why I believe they're so successful in that end-to-end -end experience. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Can't see. No, good. Tash. <laughs> I've got a question for Pam. Um, so I think that um, British Gas, you know, are widely recognised as being data-driven and customer-centric within your own particular space. Was there a tipping point where it went from something that wasn't widely accepted within your own organization to something that kind of infiltrated multiple different silos, systems, departments? It's hard to pick on a specific moment in time. Um, but as a sector, we're facing a lot of flack, understandably, um, a lot of it driven by the way the sector has developed in the last couple of decades. And I think there have been a number of moments over the last couple of years which have really highlighted how much better we need to be at customer service. So there's a combination of things where I think in 2013, there was a big price ride and Ed Miliband stood up and said, this is atrocious, I want everybody to freeze their prices, et cetera, et cetera. And the backlash against the energy companies then kind of really drove it home, something that we were already working on and accelerated the change. Um, other things that have accelerated the change is uh, regulation. Um, and regulation because smart meters is actually something that is driven by regulation and that's there's a target to hit by 2020 and we're getting all of this data in and we need to figure out what we can do with it so again there was the opportunity to do something for, that was more helpful for customers so those those are the two big ones thank you any other questions no? oh you've got another one one more excellent maybe someone else someone else Jeremy, Amazing. as somebody who I don't think you know, has grown up in the world of data, um, as, a, as a customer, what's the best experience that you've had with a brand that is data-driven? Um, <laughs> that's difficult to say. I think well, it's easier to say. I mean, it sort of goes back to a point that Ben was talking about. It's like um, I find it staggering that retail in particular, which has got a long history of accessing and having your data is so bad at using it. So the rewards you get, I mean, they're the same things you were getting 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The fact that it doesn't know it's your birthday, it's your wedding anniversary, and it doesn't react to that, but it'll send you, you know, a coupon for some cleaning product, because that's what you bought two weeks. I, I find that in this day and age quite staggering. I'm trying to think of a good one, I'm sure there are, but it's easier, I'm afraid, to think of bad ones. Does anybody have a good one on the panel? I have a good one. Um, I was about to take your microphone there, but I have one. Um, uh, Net-a-Porte um, and Outnet, they're excellent in that they, um, you, I was actually quite shocked where, you know, I was just, just shopping and, you know, clicking on um, different um, outfits. I like to shop, it's probably not, not a surprise. Um, and, um, and actually, the next time that I visited, they remembered my customer behaviour and actually said, you put the, you know, you selected these things. And actually, it made me think, I'm going to buy that. So from a customer point of view, they really listened to me. Whereas instead of just shoving advertising at me, um, they really thought about, um, you know, what, what I was looking for and remembered those choices. Um, so I thought that was, that was excellent. Probably someone's got another one except clothes. Pam. I mean, the thing for me is getting an alert when I go overdrawn or I'm about to go overdrawn because I don't want to pay penalty charges and things like that. So really simple things that make a difference. Um, the other thing is I was just trying to sell, not my house, my mother-in-law's house in Wales. Um, and I found Zoopla amazing yeah. for that. And the kind of being able to go on, get uh, reports of um, how the, the market is changing in that area and therefore what's the right kind of price. And then that actually in conjunction with a small 
local estate agent um, called McCartney. So if you're ever down in Wales and you want to buy a property in Brecon, um, but they used that data uh, to, to help us understand what was the rise price to set the house and to um, encourage visitors to, to the house to see it. And so, whereas normally it would take about nine months to sell the property in Wales, it's actually only taken us three months. Um, so I was very impressed by how other companies were using other people's data to enhance their service. That's interesting. I was just thinking there's lots and lots of examples of, of, of great examples of the way brands um, use things to um, communicate with us personally. But with us um, having so much more data at our fingertips now, is there a fine line between creepy and valuable, you know, the, the humanity side? Um, ben, do you, want to, do you want to comment on that? I think we've all had the experience of being cyber-stalked by banners. <laughs> Um, you know, this is this is where there's a there's a maturity that has to take place. Um, what's possible doesn't make it right. Um, just because you can retarget somebody, yeah. just because you can focus on them, doesn't make it a good experience. You know, the, the the thread that's been running through everything that everybody said is, you know, start with the customer experience. It, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to look across channels, across those touch points when you're advertising, when you've got customer service, when you've got operations, when you've got commerce and sales to get a joined up view of that. This is why one of the largest growth positions on boards at the moment is what they're calling chief customer officers, somebody who owns the customer, the customer experience, who can say to IT or marketing or anyone else, no, piss off, it's not gonna work, that's not a nice experience, it isn't nice. Just because you can target the hell out of somebody doesn't mean you should. So I think, you know, there are, there are big challenges in being able to leverage this but leverage it in a way that is natural and is easy. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that's probably the possible. Um, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, that it's probable. Yeah. And I think that's probably a really good time to end because I've just been told the time's up. So thank you very much to all of our panellists. Um, I think that was a really, really interesting discussion. Hopefully we all understand a bit, bit more about data. And we didn't really mention the BD word too much, did we? Which was, which was really refreshing. So, so thank you very much.